sometimes you will find a gene will be duplicated. There will be an extra copy of the gene. There will be two copies, one after the other. Gene duplication. Sometimes you can have even a, a larger expansion of the number of copies of a gene, or you can have duplication of a whole stretch of genes. And this is falling into this new area that people refer to calling it copy number variant. And ranging from one extra copy of one gene to massive duplication of whole stretches of chromosomes. And no surprise, you wind up getting interestingly different things going on at that point. What we'll see later on in the course is there's more and more evidence that the disease schizophrenia involves mutations in copy number variants. And here, this is not a mutation in one base pair. This is not a mutation in one transcription. This is like extra copies of genes sitting there. This can have some very interesting implications. In some cases, the second gene can function as a backup. If something goes wrong in the first one, there's a second one there doing its job, and there's some suggestion that something like that is occurring in some subsets of Alzheimer's disease. Or what you can have is the number of copies of the gene you make has something to do with how much of the protein you make. And there's recent studies showing that when you compare Japanese populations with Western European ones, on the average, Japanese populations have more copies of a gene that has multiple copies, more copies of a gene that makes an enzyme related to carbohydrate digestion. I have no idea what the implications would be of that, but this is not a populational difference in a DNA sequence or in a protein. This is simply the number of copies of a gene. What a second copy, what a duplication also allows you to do in the most metaphorical sense is experiment with one of the copies because the other one is there taking care of whatever the function is that's critical. What you will see is you get faster evolution going on with genes that you have duplicated where one of them is the one that in a sense is freed to have more dramatic movement and what you then see is it's more likely to stumble into some great use use without sacrificing the initial use in the process. And there's a guy, University of Oregon, named Joe Thornton, who's done really interesting work on the evolution of genes for steroid receptors. And what he has shown from ancestral genes is that's exactly what's occurred. A lot of what are now two different genes for two different types of steroid receptors were once duplicates of the same gene, and one was allowed to float and eventually, in at least some cases, stumbled into something useful while the other one held into place. In passing, what that phenomenon does is help explain one of the endless, frustrating, exasperating, irritating things that people who attack the notion of evolution bring up, which is the famed soundbite that they have of the problem of irre irreproducible, irreducible complexity. It always runs the same way, which is saying evolution can't possibly exist because what good is half of an eye? You've got to have those intermediate forms. And what good is it? You couldn't have invented an eye. Evolution could not have produced an eye in one mutation, one generation. And thus, it would have to be in a series of steps. And what good are the series of steps? They can't exist. There can't be anything such as evolution. Off you go. Hallelujah. So what you get here in these cases is a demonstration instead by having extra copies of genes, one of which is freed to be evolving. You don't have to have a rapid transition from one to the other. You can have this thing moving along, stumbling along, until it just happens to come up with a shape of a receptor that just happens to be able to bind a hormone that stumbled its own way into existence 10,000 generations earlier, which because it was duplicated, it didn't matter that one copy was now of a form where there was no receptor on Earth for it until it happened to stumble into that. And there's more and more evidence that duplicated genes have, have a way of describing these intermediate states where you don't necessarily have half an eye, but instead you have the pieces ready in place there for when one thing suddenly pops up which completes the picture. 
In fact, you can have, as it turns out, sort of half an eye. Russ Fernald in the biology department has done really cool research on the evolution of eyes, and you should read about it sometime to read basically how eyes evolved from like a single layer of cells on the surface of some ancient proto something, and you sure do can have half an eye and a gazillion intermediate forms. Nonetheless, this business of multiple copies allowing you the freedom to have looser evolving of single genes at a time, critical mechanism.